he runs two amazing music groups, at least two. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm, I'm not going to steal your thunder. You're welcome to talk about that as well, and I know you have a dynamite presentation coming up, so I'm just going to pass this on to you. Okay. Thank Thanks. you so much, Ken. Thanks, Ian. Hi, everyone. I'm Ken Hoy. Uh, so I've uh, been involved with OpenStack for a couple of years. I'm curr uh, currently the co-organizer for OpenStack user groups in New York City, Connecticut, and Philadelphia. Um, co-organizer. So, <laughs> so uh, we've kind of created a model where, uh, since I know a lot of folks in the community, my job is to arrange speakers. And then in each uh, location, we actually have a local organizer who's in charge of, the of logistics and facilities. And uh, because, as you can imagine, New York is a big draw for a lot of vendors <laughs> in terms of wanting to speak, we've kind of adopted a model that basically says, if you want to come to speak at the New York City meetup, you have to agree to speak in Philadelphia and Connecticut that same week. <laughs> and by doing it that way, so it's a model that we're uh, sort of testing out, which would be the idea of, uh, you know, one way we could spread a lot of s user groups where in small areas where maybe vendors aren't as incentivized to speak would be to create a, uh, create a anchor, in essence an anchor user group in a large uh, city where vendors want to speak and then build a lot of smaller user groups around it and basically say, you want to speak to that large user group, you have to speak to the, uh, the smaller ones as well. So that's a model that works for the most part for us. So, um, uh, so I actually try to be fair to the vendors. So if you guys know anything about the geography, Connecticut's New York City's in the center, Connecticut's north, Philadelphia south. So I try to make them go either north to south or south up. So New York City ends up being in the middle. So. Um, so it's worked out, so that's uh, one of the things that, one of the ideas I'm trying to float by, maybe the foundation. Uh, speaking of which, there, there's, I'm also part of the um, Open um, OpenStack Ambassadors group. How many of you are aware of that group? Okay, only a few of you. So it's basically, we were um, selected by the foundation as folks who've been involved in the community, and part of my charter, being part of that group, is we are to spread the word about OpenStack and to help uh, people who want to start user groups. Um, so if, uh, obviously I'm, I'm best capable of helping you if you happen to be near New York, the East Coast, uh, but it doesn't matter if you're in another country, if you just need some advice, um, I'm certainly happy to help, or I can point you to the OpenStack ambassador who's covering your region. So that's what I say about user groups. <laughs> um, what I want to do today is go through a presentation. Um, so this is a talk I've actually done in the past in uh, Elder Summits uh, about OpenStack for VMware. And th the story behind that really is uh, I actually uh, have a lot of experience with VMware. And when I got into OpenStack, it was around this, uh, shortly after that, VMware started making a lot of noise about being integrated into OpenStack. And I found there wasn't a lot of documentation about that. Um, so I started drill drilling down on the existing documentation and basically bugging the uh, OpenStack team at VMware as much as possible to find out exactly how things actually work. So I've kind of given this presentation, uh, and the f a lot of the focus of this also is that uh, I used to work at Rackspace on the OpenStack team, and I would say half my uh, conversations with customers were trying to talk them out of using OpenStack. Um, and what I mean by that, and you'll see, is there are certain things like Oracle Rack, <laughs> that may not be a good fit for an OpenStack cloud. And sometimes customers aren't, users aren't clear on that. So, um, so I'm gonna walk through that in this presentation. So. Okay, so why VMware and why, and or use OpenStack with it, VMware? Well, that's a, great, that's a great place to start because I think uh, there is a tendency for some of us <laughs> who like to chase after shiny new things. And you go, OpenStack's a shiny new thing, and oh, it's free. So therefore, we will use it to replace everything we're doing with VMware. I'm going to tell you why that's not a great idea. Um, because one of the, the key thing that you need to think about in any kind of uh, architecture design, infrastructure-wise, it's that the dictum is workload to take dictates architecture. So you don't select your cloud platform and then say, let me, f let me just throw all my workloads on there. You start with the workload. You start figuring out what it is I actually want to run, what is it that my business needs to accomplish their goals, and then say, I will find the architecture, the platform that fits 
fits underneath that workload. Otherwise, you will have failures and, and your users will not be very happy. Uh, so we talk, uh, how many of you are familiar with this term, third platform, second platform? Have you heard this before? This is kind of new. So just think of it, second platform is traditional IT workloads like Oracle, ERP, right? Exchange, perhaps. Third platform are things like Twitter, Facebook. Kind of web scale, uh, very social, you know. A good example is I have a customer who's a, uh, who's a big bank. Right, and they've ran almost all their stuff on, you know, mainframes <laughs> even, but certainly also on like Big Iron, uh, you know, Oracle application running on uh, HP servers go on a, you know, three par or or an EMC array. But um, that when they did that, they were they were really only focused on getting data out to these ATMs, right? W you know, uh, which is uh, could be large, but it's not super large. And now all of a sudden they're going, you know what, I need to provide the same level of services and data to users who may be accessing that data from five different devices, right? From an ATM to a PC to their phone. And all of a sudden the, the exponential amount of growth in that, in, in that scale means that I can't use that same legacy application. So this uh, bank is looking at things like object storage, for example, uh, to, to store your check images, right? As opposed to storing on a NFS file system, which can't scale to the levels that they th they expect they have to scale. So that's that's so that's that's a I so this is an important differentiation between what is a second platform workload and what is a third platform workload, because knowing which one you're targeting helps you decide which architecture and which cloud platform you need to run on. S so if you guys are traditional kind of you know data center folks, you'll recognize all the second platform stuff, right? These are these are things are very where the the application and the OS and the hardware is very tightly coupled, right? If if you're running Oracle on a server <laughs> and it's a sans you know uh, sans storage, if that storage dies, your Oracle is going down, is going down hard, <laughs> right? And you and now you you're in a failure recovery scenario. Um, the other things th these tends to be very much a traditional. Uh, database servers, again, like an Oracle or SQL server that has certain, that assumes that the infrastructure on it, uh, underneath it, it's always up and running, right? Kind of nine, you know, five nines availability, right? And it doesn't deal well if the infrastructure kind of goes away all of a sudden. Um, and they tend to be steady state and very, uh, so I know that if some of you are working in places where there are, there are such things as peaks, right? Maybe at the end of the month or at the end of the quarter, but generally speaking with, with traditional apps, you kind of know what the boundaries are, right? You, every month you know you're gonna spike up by X percentage, more or less. So you can kind of build, you know, you ever heard that kind of built for the uh, built for the peak, right? Um, because it's, because uh, you're not gonna have a very elastic infrastructure, you wanna make sure you can account for that. But you know what that peak is at the end of the month or quarter. And then operator focus. So what, how many of you guys, how many of you here have done work on things like uh, Windows or, or um, VMware, for example. A few of you. So I always ask this question when I talk to VMware admins, which is how many of you who are doing VMware admin work um, give credentials to your developers to the web to the uh, web for your client and say you go ahead and provision your own VMs and storage. So I've talked to uh, several hundred. I found one guy <laughs> who does that, right? Because that traditional workload, uh, because it's, it's of its complexity, right? It, it uh, assumes that uh, the you don't want it the end user to have access directly to that resource, right? So the cloud, so the admin becomes kind of the gateway to provision resources. And as a result, you need a very resilient type of infrastructure, right? Could be like a vBlock, but it could also be uh, HP's cloud system, or whatever it may be, IBM's, um, where the go the go here is the storage never fails, <laughs> right? Or well, it's because it's highly redundant. Uh, or you've depending on something like VMware, right? Where you assume when the when the VM underneath when the sorry the hypervisor server underneath the workload fails, all the VMs just restart, and the application shouldn't even know it's running on a brand new physical server, right? Um, that's in direct contrast to these third platform, this web-based type of workloads that needs to scale, right? In these, in this, 
in this world, applications don't necessarily have a one-to-one -one correspondence. Sometimes an application lives across multiple servers, right? And you could have a piece of that fail, and the application will continue running and just recover itself somewhere else. Um, and th these tend to be very unpredictable, right? It's kind of the, the type of workloads where, uh, you know, you put out a new product on the web, and you th you th you're sizing it for 1,000 users, and actually it's possible it could spike up to 200,000, <laughs> right, in a few minutes, and then back down again. And so how do you design for that, right? How do you, if you have to, if you have to, like, provision a V, every time you provision a VM, you got to ask an administrator to do it for you? <laughs> how do you scale for that? It's impossible, right? Everything, you have to automate everything, which is, again, one of the key tenets of, of a third platform cloud, which is what I would um, put OpenStack as primary design for. It's very, when I say developer focus, it means that uh, everything, everything is exposed via APIs. Right? Develop, the idea is developer can provision his own machines, right, his own storage and networking without the operator having to come into the middle. And that's how you can scale very rapidly. And the design assumption at that kind of scale out level is that um, the infrastructure will fail, right? So the app, so w I I this is the this is the area that's very important because again, when I talk to a lot of banks, traditional enterprises, they they go, "Can I put Oracle on here on OpenStack? Can I expect that when if a compute node fails, or the app Oracle will just recover by itself?" Uh, the VM that's running it on another machine. And I actually have to tell them, no, that's not the case. <laughs> OpenStack is not designed to do f automatic failover when a VM, uh, when the hypervisor node crashes. Which I never brings up this question, right? You guys have been at it four years and you guys can't figure out how to do VM H in an automatic HA? What's going on here, right? Wh why, is that, why is there this deficiency in the product? And the answer I give is that you need to know what the design principles are, right? Open whereas VMware was very much designed for resiliency, right, on a, on a limited, I would say fairly limited scale, OpenStack, because of its desire to be a private cloud uh, alternative, like a private cloud like an AWS, is designed for rapid scale, right? The idea is to, to grow really fast, Right, and, and when you do that, certain things are inevitable, right? So if you have a VMware environment with 100, you know, 1,000 VMs, that's a fairly sizable one. But that maybe that sits on, you know, 10, uh, 20, 30 servers w with a tied to a SAN storage. It's a small enough environment that you can design this thing to n the infrastructure to not fail. What happens when you're talking about web scale, and now you're talking a couple of hundred thousand VMs, right? And, and it's spread out across thousands of servers, right? If you look at the probability, it's, it, something will always fail somewhere, right? It's impossible in that large scale and environment to be able to assure that the, that the server doesn't fail or the storage or the networking or even the underlying VM uh, hypervisor won't fail. Something will always fail somewhere. <laughs> so. The, the goal here is you need to just assume that it's the case and build for it. So you design for it to fail. You assume the wheels are going to come off at any time in the infrastructure, and you build, you design your applications uh, when it's on OpenStack to be able to account for that. So I'm actually going to skip this because <laughs> I'm assuming all you know what OpenStack is, right? So OpenStack orchestrates a lot of uh, virtual resources and presents them up, right? Very, again, very importantly, as self-service on-demand APIs for end users. And again, the goal very clearly here is not around infrastructure resiliency. The goal of OpenStack is to figure out how you can help developers deliver, I, uh, or, uh, sorry, uh, operators develop self-service IT to their developers at rapid scale. And things like shared s infrastructure SANs, like you have to run on VMware, um, one of the tenants is the more shared infrastructure there is, the more limited your scalability, right? So by having a non, uh, uh, not, uh, nothing shared architecture in OpenStack, right, not using a lot of SAND disk, you're actually able to scale more rapidly than you could in a, in a shared SAND environment. 
But the, never, the reality is, as, we're, as OpenStack is maturing and getting into the enterprise, right? More and more customers are going, well, I want to I, I wanna run both, <laughs> right? How many, how many enterprises have nothing but Platform 3? Well, that's all they have coming up new. No one, right? Everyone's got platform, kind of that older Platform 2 stuff. And, pl and maybe they're growing into that Platform 3. And they want to be able to run both in the environment, right? So there is, um, there I think there is a desire for customers to say, I don't want to have to run two different cloud platforms that are managed completely separately. So VMware kind of got into the game, kind of to address some of this. And today, there's uh, actually a couple of ways you can do this, right? One way, which uh, we VMware has done a pretty good job of, is they basically took uh, vSphere, which is their hypervisor technology, and folded it in underneath of OpenStack, right? Because one of the things I shared, talked about is OpenStack is actually not a hypervisor, right? It is a orchestration of virtual resources, including multiple, including hypervisors. So you can actually uh, run OpenStack with KVM, with Zen, with with Hyper-V, or with uh, vSphere in this case. So what you, so the way, you, and the interesting thing about how v VMware does it is, they basically take a vSphere cluster, right, and expose that to the cloud, the uh, OpenStack services, Nova services, as a single compute node. So the benefit of that is from the no from your APIs, you can provision uh, machines, right, to a vSphere hypervisor, just like you do now with to KVM. So it's the exact same API commands. But from VMware's perspective, once once the uh, command goes out to provision a VM in, uh, under VMware, it actually uses vCenter. So now you get all the stuff we talked about that <laughs> you can't do with OpenStack generally, natively, like having uh, VMs fail over automatically, or happens underneath vSphere, underneath of OpenStack. So one of the models that we try to do is basically creating two availability zones. So if you're familiar with the concept of availability zones, basically you're, you're going to section off a subset of your infrastructure and say, that that's called my, my, my platform two or my VMware um, availability zone, and your developer can choose to provision VMs and applications onto that zone. And then you can have another zone, one in KVM, without shared storage, and you can run all your web applications and your NoSQL databases. Right, so that's a that's a, a good approach to take. Uh, second approach, uh, how many of you have heard, heard about this VMware integrated OpenStack? Some of you have. So uh, very quickly, it's just this is VMware's own distribution of OpenStack. Right? But it's the concept here is that of a, uh, what they call, think of it as an undercloud and an overcloud. So the undercloud is actually is what the VMware admins actually, um, where you put all your OpenStack services, that actually runs on vSphere. And then you have an overcloud, which is your OpenStack services, and like Nova and Neutron. And the idea is, if I put, if I put this on top of that overcloud, undercloud, now I have, A, I have all the resiliency that I have with vSphere, and I can, I can manage it like it's a VMware application. So, some of you guys, uh, you mentioned you're a VMware admin, so think about what if, you know, your boss came to you and said, you know, we need to spin up OpenStack for my developers. And you're scratching your head because you don't, <laughs> you haven't played with OpenStack, right? And, but now you're, you've got a week to get this rolled out. You know, and some of you have done OpenStack, know how complicated that can be. Uh, what if doing that means you just, you basically right click on your VM, your web, vSphere web client, and there's a V app. An app, an icon that says OpenStack. You right-click, answer a few questions, and it just basically blows out an OpenStack environment on top of your VMware infrastructure. And now, from the from developer's perspective, if is that he's using all the AP OpenStack APIs like it's a native OpenStack, but for you as an admin, you just treat it like it's VMware. And that person can then configure the VMware Yes. Yeah. So right now, the first cut is going to be. VMware only, but they plan to support KVM as well. So this is, there's, you know, there's pros and cons to everything, but the big pro here is if you're a VMware guy, or, or you're working VMware guys who need to get OpenStack up and running, this is probably the fastest way, because it's the most familiar tools that, that, that they, they have. 
So I think my time's up. Uh, unless you have this, this time for questions or any, anyone have questions? Okay. Yeah. Yep. So what they use, uh, you familiar with something called NSX? Basically NSX has, uh, has an option called multi-hypervisor. Basically you run that and you can, uh, you can run it through open V switch on a KVM side and then an NSX switch. Oh sorry, it's NSX across both environments. Yeah. That's what you could do, yes. Well, so, so when I say available, so basically I would say all the fee sphere clusters are its own zone, and, you've, and you want to do like Oracle, you put it into that zone, and it'll, it'll make then Nova will make sure that it only gets provision in a fee sphere cluster that provides the HA. Obviously, there's stuff underneath that, like you have to have a share sand, right? Otherwise, it won't work. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. The next slide or next slide or previous slide? Yep. 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 Right. So this is this is for the um, so VMware, uh, as I mentioned before, is a very operator focused. So I don't know anyone that loves the VMware API, except for the guy who wrote it. <laughs> and I have to know who he is. <laughs> uh, developers though love of the OpenStack API, right? Because they can do everything they need. Um, so the idea behind this is we're basically cloaking VMware environment be, uh, behind these OpenStack APIs. From the developer's perspective, they don't know that it's VMware. They just think it's virtual infrastructure they provision, right? But you're getting all the good, but the, the key thing is the cloud admin who knows VMware can manage it like it's VMware. And it can use, all, in fact, use all the tools that comes with VM, like vCloud to actually uh, monitor the environment. So, okay, yeah, I think that's it. API, as you said, right, uh, VMware API is uh, what the people, I mean, I, I would, I dare to differ with that. Okay. Because I come from a strong VMware background. Yeah, yeah. And I'm a VMware expert, V expert too. Okay, yep, okay. yep. So, so what happens is that uh, when the VMware actually released those APIs, right, so um, it was a very product-centric, it was very OEM-centric. Yeah. Whereas if you look at uh, OpenStack, it is a developer-centric. Yes, yep. Right? Yeah. Story yep, yep. Right? But a bunch of developers didn't make uh, VMware initially. Yeah, yeah. It was a project, and then you know somebody developed that, and you know uh, then the Dan Adrian or somebody, right? So, and then. Uh, Mendes uh, yeah. yeah, Mendelssohn. So then, mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and then uh, it was a proper product, proper enterprise company, right? So, if you look at all the storage, right? Uh, VI APIs right? Yep. and Vaza uh, and all those, all those APIs are, right? So, all those APIs are actually meant for the product, so the enterprise to work. So it's yeah. not enterprise. So the two, yeah. two things, the two approaches are completely different. Right. right. Yeah, bo both have pros and cons, yeah. right? So, yeah. so VIO is not a silver bullet. <laughs> I think it's, it's got, it's, uh, there's a great use case for using it, but there are certain use cases where VI, you know, running native OpenStack may be a better option. Depends, yeah. right? So. Kenneth has been doing a great job. I mean, I've been following Kenneth for a long time. <laughs> and I've seen his presentation in Atlanta as well. So uh, you're bored by it. You <laughs> <see>. <laughs> so, yeah, and uh, this is something that yeah, I wanted to uh, show. It's very really relevant. I mean, uh, it's, it's not part of the presentation or something. But uh, I wrote actually uh, two blog posts earlier. Um, so way before VMware announced uh, VIO thing, I wrote a uh, blog post, how do you actually work VMware with OpenStack? So um, I had used a couple of uh, the reference architectures, all those things. So there you can actually see, uh, let me see if you look at, yeah, this is the one. There are plenty of seats, so come on in. We'll make room for you. I can't find it. Okay, thank you. Can you see that? Okay. So, uh, <coughs> So in this slide, if you uh, see, the, I think I wrote it in March 20th. Yeah. So VMware hadn't announced a uh, VIO thing, VMware integrated OpenStack that time. So how VMware actually integrates uh, OpenStack uh, with other partners like uh, Milanti's uh, Canonical, um, Red Hat, and uh, Suze, I guess, yes. Um, so this is the architecture that you see. 
Um, so if you look at this, so th this is th uh, this one is with uh, Ubuntu. So here on the on the on the violet color, you see <coughs> all the violet boxes are basically Ubuntu products, Ubuntu technology, right? So here you see Ubuntu, uh, Mars, Juju, and Landscape and Charm, and um, here all the blue stuffs are uh, uh, mm -hmm. VMware's product and services, and uh, all the orange uh, ones are the OpenStack services. So if you look at here in the cloud operation, it's at vCenter, VC Ops, and the Login Site Manager, etc. Right, and um, th then there are uh, you know vSAN. You can connect to vSAN or third-party um, <coughs> storage here, right? So this connects to Cinder, and then you have NSX product and VMware networking, so which will connect to your Neutron, uh, which will manage your Neutron, and then you have ESX Sky and the, the vCenter, which will take care of your compute stuff. Great. Right. Thank you. Yeah. So. Um, so I just thought that this was kind of relevant to the conversation that we just had with Kenneth, so.